Welcome to the course Neural Data Science. My name is Aaron Newman and I will be teaching this course to you. Today we're going to cover the basic outline of what this course is about, learning objectives, what is data science, what is neural data science, and talk a little bit about the tools that we're going to be using in this course and the mindsets that are optimal for you to engage with as you're learning neural data science and how to code. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that I'm producing this material as part of my work for Dalhousie University. Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people that we now know today as Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. We pay respect to the indigenous knowledges held by the Mi'kmaq people and to the wisdom of their elders past and present. The Mi'kmaq people signed peace and friendship treaties with the Crown and Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982 recognizes and affirms Aboriginal and treaty race. Personally, I'm very grateful to all of our Indigenous forebearers for protecting this land, nourishing it and cherishing it. And every day I try to enjoy the land and understand more about it. I also acknowledge that the history, contributions and legacies of the African Nova Scotian people and communities who have been here for over 400 years have also enriched our culture and our environment. So the basic outline for this lecture is what is data science, what is neural data science, why should scientists even learn to code, and then the overall learning objectives for the course, the mindsets to engage with, and the technologies used in this course. So what is data science? I have a couple of quotes here, one from Wynne 2019 says, it's an umbrella term to describe the entire complex and multi-step process used to extract value from data. Another from Davenport and Patil 2012, says it's the ability to bring structure to large quantities of formless data and make analysis possible. For a long time, I kind of thought data science was really just a trendy word for statistics, but it turns out when you really think about it, there's a lot more to it than that. So it turns out that data science is not the same thing as statistics. So in statistics, we're typically testing hypotheses based on data. So we formulate hypotheses and then we collect the data and then we test those hypotheses. And using statistics correctly avoids what we call harking or hypothesizing after results are known, which is unfortunately quite common in neuroscience, psychology, and other areas of research. The idea of statistics is we make our predictions before we collect the data, before we look at the data, and then we use statistics to test whether or not our predictions are correct or not based on the data. Data science is a much bigger field that encompasses statistics as one step along the way but it's focused more broadly on how do we even store data? How do we represent it? How do we organize it? How do we manipulate it? How do we remove noise from the data, filter it, optimize the data to identify particular features that we're interested in and reduce extraneous noise, measurement error, things like that. How do we visualize the data? How do we explore the data and understand it? So this can get into the territory of not necessarily harking, but not constraining ourselves just to test hypotheses, but really to understand what patterns are there and mine our data for information and insight. Then we could use statistics to test particular hypotheses, and we can also use machine learning to make predictions from our data as to what other data might look like, or if we collect additional data, we could use machine learning to make predictions about that data. So for example, is this person characteristic of a particular disease or are they healthy? In neuroscience and psychology, data science is increasingly important because increasingly, and you know, I venture to say almost exclusively, data is collected with computers or at least it's collected and then entered into a digital format and saved on computers. We're seeing more and more large detailed data sets or big data, which means from each individual we might have many trials, high spatial and temporal resolutions, say from EEG or fMRI scanners. Data might be collected over multiple time points, so longitudinal data. We might collect data from many measures, so we might collect neuroimaging data along with genetic data, behavioral data, demographic data, and so on. And we might be collecting data from not just a handful of individuals in a more sort of traditional lab-based study, but we might be collecting data from hundreds or even thousands of individuals, either at one site or across multiple sites. So just the explosion in the amount of data that we have to work with necessitates tools that enable us to, to work with that data effectively and gain insights from it. There's also an increasing expectation of what we call open science, which means that 
we don't just collect data in a lab, save it in the lab, analyze it, write up the results and publish them in a paper, but we actually make our data sets available publicly when we publish the paper. And we also make our analysis pipelines and the code that we use to perform those analyses publicly available as well. And that ensures that our results are reproducible. It ensures that we're accountable for our results. Other scientists can examine what we did and confirm that we came to valid conclusions or potentially identify errors in what we did. And it ultimately ensures that the results that we're publishing are actually reproducible given the data sets and analysis pipelines that we used. So when we talk about data and in particular neural data, very generally information could be described or defined as a difference that makes a difference or news of a difference. This goes back to Gregory Bateson, 1972. Data is information that's collected typically as part of a research study. Data has broader definition, but within the scope of this course, and when we're talking about neural data science, we're typically talking about information that was collected as part of a formal research study. These could be experiments or observations, experiments being cases where we systematically manipulate variables and look at the outcomes. Observations being more we just observe brain activity or behavior, in less constrained kind of environment. So ultimately our data are a set of measurements from which we aim to extract meaning. Neural data is typically collected from a sample of units. Those could be individual humans, individual animals, individual neurons, etc. And the data are collected in some way, either through observation or through say electrodes or MRI scanners or button presses, and they're stored digitally. We assume that the data were collected in a way that meaning can be derived. In other words, the data were collected using good scientific practices, they were systematic in how procedures were applied, and that the data were stored in a systematic way that is relatively free from error, if not entirely free. And in this course and in the practice of neural data science, we focus on what we do with the data after we've collected it, not how we collect it. But at the same time, as a data scientist, it's on you to understand what is the nature of the data that you're working with? What sort of equipment was used? What was the experiment that was performed when the data were collected? What are the sort of features of the data you're working with? So say EEG or single unit data from electrodes or MRI scanners, all those data have very different properties and different things you need to understand in terms of how you make sense of it and the steps, procedures that you apply to it. A lot of that is beyond the scope of the course, although for specific data types that we use as examples, we will dig into that. Doing data science ultimately requires coding or programming. So writing instructions for a computer using a specific language. And historically in neuroscience, coding hasn't been a core part of most curricula, but it's increasingly become clear to educators and neuroscientists that this has to change. For example, this paper was published in the journal Neuron in 2021, saying the next generation of neuroscientists needs to learn how to code and we need new ways to teach them. And here you go, here's a course that is gonna do just that for you. Now, one thing that I've heard from students in the past is, well, I know how to use spreadsheets, programs like Excel or Google Sheets. Very familiar with that. And it's actually a lot easier for me just to apply what I already know than to take the time to learn how to code and coding is tedious and I make errors and it's very frustrating. I can just use Excel and get it done much faster. There's a lot of issues with that. So working through spreadsheets, it's highly prone to human error because it's dependent on you often manually entering data, selecting cells, clicking around, doing particular steps. That can be tedious and not scalable for large data sets. So if each data set is in a separate Excel file and you need to apply the same procedures to say the data from 10, let alone 100 or 1,000 data sets, that's gonna get tedious and repetitive and the odds of you making errors increases. And those errors are gonna be human errors that happen randomly. They're gonna be very hard to detect and correct in the future. It's hard to document all the steps because if your steps involve selecting, copy and pasting, pressing buttons in a spreadsheet program, those are all things you can do and mentally you can think about you know, what I did and write them down, but it's hard for somebody else to necessarily pick that up and reproduce it in exactly the same way you did it. And there's a lot of limitations to what spreadsheets can do. You certainly can't do fMRI analysis in a spreadsheet. And think about what I said before about open science and reproducibility. We wanna be able to 
analyze our data in ways that are entirely transparent, clear, readable, reproducible. And if there's errors in there, if you've written it in computer code, then that error, it may be a human error, but it's clearly documented in the code because the code is right there and anybody can change it and fix it and fix it systematically for the entire data set. So using coding for data science, it's scalable. It doesn't matter if you have one data set or a thousand data sets, you can repeat that thing. Computers are good at those kinds of repetitive tasks. It's auditable, meaning that anybody can look at your code and understand if they know what that code means, if they know, say, the Python programming language, they can understand what happened. It's reproducible. Every time you run that program, you're going to get the same results if you give it the same data. It's more powerful because you can do a lot more with it. And it's more flexible because there's so many different tools and things that you can do with coding. Hopefully, if you got this far, you're already convinced that coding is the way to go. You don't have to need to know any coding to start doing this course. We're going to teach that to you. I'm going to elaborate on reproducibility a bit. I've talked about that already, but in the context of open science. So open science is a movement to make the practice of scientific research and the dissemination of its results freely accessible. So this can include things like publishing your papers in journals that are behind a paywall so anybody can read them. But truly open science also involves providing access to all of the data that were used to produce the results that you talk about in the paper and all of the steps and tools that were used in the data analysis, as well as the manuscript that describes the results. Well-written code is essential to providing transparent and reproducible results. So you can write uh, code to do data science and data analysis uh, in many different ways. You can get the same sort of end result with different approaches to writing the code. Some of that is more transparent and more clear and better documented than other approaches. And so part of open science and reproducibility is not just providing your code, but actually writing your code in ways that adhere to good programming style, that are clear, systematic, and well-documented. Good data science skills are therefore essential to properly manage and organize the data and share the code that produces the results. In this course, we focus on providing you with access to entirely open source and freely available software. Now, there's a few different definitions in there. Uh, first of all, open so source software means that all the underlying code for the software is openly accessible. Anybody can see it, anybody can audit it. And this is typically developed by a distributed network of individuals. Some of these might be paid to do the work, some might be doing it on a voluntary basis. The use of open source software, it's generally free, but it may or may not require payment or licensing. So there are many cases of open source software that if you use it in a particular way, for instance, in a for-profit context, you may still have to pay for it, even though the source code is transparent. Free software means that the software is free to use, copy, share, and modify. So it's more liberal than open source. In this course, we're gonna provide you with tools that you can download and use for free. They're under different license agreements. They're not necessarily entirely free, but the materials that we're sharing, the code that we're sharing, all the videos are released under a Creative Commons license that does allow you to reuse and adapt and share the material further as long as you give credit where credit is due and acknowledge the sources that you got it from. Okay, so moving on to what programming language we're actually going to focus on in this course. There are a number of popular languages for doing data science. One that we'll focus on in this course is Python, and I'll talk more about that later. Another is MATLAB. MATLAB is quite widely used in science and engineering, but it's not free. It costs money to use a license. You may have a free access to it as a student or through affiliation with the university, but I've avoided it because it is not ultimately free. Another one that is free is Julia. I would say Julia is the hottest up and coming language for data science and statistics. And I'm very excited to explore it in the future, but it's still in a relatively early stage of development. And for particular applications like MRI or EEG data analysis, tools already exist in Python and they're really only in their early stages in Julia. And then finally, R is a language that you may have encountered before if you've done courses, say, in statistics. R is a great language for statistics. I use it in my lab and in my research all the time because there are a number of statistical techniques that are available in R in really robust packages that aren't necessarily available in Python. 
But in this course, we're not going to go into those advanced statistics. And Python has a rich enough ecosystem that anything that we want to do, including basic statistics like t-tests, analysis of variance, regression, you can do those in Python. You can do machine learning in Python. So it's really, if you're going to learn one language, Python is a great way to start. And it's a relatively simple language to learn relative to some other programming languages like even R or C, C++, C Sharp, Java. Python is a much nicer language if it's your first programming language. So let's go over the learning objectives for this course. I break the learning objectives down into hard skills and soft skills. Already on the hard skills side, you can see there's quite a few of them. This includes being able to extract meaning from data and also articulate the limitations of the conclusions you can draw from it. You are going to learn how to write functional and efficient code in Python to perform basic data science tasks. You're going to learn how to use an AI coding assistant to generate Python code and perform basic data science tasks. You're going to learn how to critically evaluate test and debug code generated by AI coding assistants because as wonderful as they are, they make lots of mistakes. You're going to learn to use online tools for version control, collaborative software development, and project management. You're going to learn how to read and write data files from common formats like CSV and Excel, as well as more specialized formats. You're going to learn how to organize and manipulate data structures like lists, arrays, and data frames. Work with continuous, discrete, and factorial data visualize data in a variety of graphical formats, perform exploratory data analysis using graphical and basic statistical operations, perform basic signal processing on data, such as filtering in temporal and spatial dimensions, build and run data processing pipelines on various types of neuroscience data, including single unit recordings, time series, 2D, 3D, and 4D images, understand basic concepts and common tools used in machine learning, including touching on deep neural networks, and extend your skills further using online resources, because at the end of the day, there's always more to learn, and we don't want you to just learn the material in this course, but to learn how to learn more. There's also some soft skill learning objectives. So if you're a student in this course formally, we're going to expect you to demonstrate a professional work ethic, to be effective and productive in hybrid, in-person, and remote working environments, working collaboratively, effectively, and productively in a distributed team. Because if you're working on a science project or a data science project in a professional setting, whether it's academic or commercial, you're inevitably going to be working on a team and have shared responsibilities, and you need to learn how to do that now. You're going to learn how to manage projects, so managing time and human resources effectively to achieve specific objectives on a stated timeline. You're going to learn peer review of the work of other team members, Teach others skills and solutions you discover. Communicate your approach to discovering these. Articulate your strengths and weaknesses as a data scientist working in a team and identify ways to improve your abilities. Demonstrate skills you've developed using a portfolio of work to potential supervisors and employers. And use and communicate the value of open reproducible code and data. So if you've never coded before, if you haven't worked with data a lot, there's some mindsets that it's good to lay out now because what you're learning here is going to be different probably from things you've learned in the past and how you approach it, how you approach the learning task, how you engage with it, how you deal with problems. Some of this might be quite unfamiliar and initially it's probably going to be a bit disconcerting and frustrating. So this course treats you as an adult learner who brings a mature and serious commitment to participating fully in the course. We assume your motivation for taking this course is to learn how to use Python to perform data science in the context of neuroscience. And we also aim to give you experience that are similar to what you might experience in a real workplace, especially outside of academia. So what are often called 21st century skills or those soft skills I talked about before. You need to spend time learning and working on your own, but communication with your peers will help you learn more and learn more deeply. So don't hesitate to reach out and chat with other classmates, even when you're working through individual assignments or exercises, and most definitely on those team assignments. This isn't a class where you can avoid working on it for a while and then cram at the end, because as I'm going to talk about in a minute, it's not about memorization, it's about procedure, and you only learn by doing. So you have to, in an ongoing way, be actively engaged and working on the course material. So be sure to set aside time every week, if not every day, a few days a week for sure, where you pick away at this and start working through it and practice and reinforce what you learn. I love this quote from Chantel, who was uh, one of the first students to take the course. She said, I do find that there's a learning curve when it comes to starting to learn coding. 
something I'm not super familiar with and making sure that I'm taking my time to really grasp the information I'm taking in has posed as a challenge. I'm used to reading information from a textbook and just memorizing facts, definitions, and data for tests. It's different to actually apply the information that I'm learning, the different learning style that I currently enjoy learning. I think it's something many students find they need to adjust to. And I think that's absolutely true. And I've heard that from a lot of students, but Chantel wrote it quite nicely there. Now, as you get frustrated, as you run into trouble, how do you get help? Now, one of the course learning objectives is extending your skills using online resources. And the reality is that most programmers and data scientists rely on internet searches all the time because we don't have all that knowledge packed into our heads. Coding is very precise. It's very finicky about where you put commas and brackets and parentheses and semicolons and capitalization. And for each command, the actual options and the way you use that command, there's a lot of detail in there. And most people don't have all that memorized so that they can produce it fluently. And as well, you're going to constantly encounter challenges, things that you want to do that you haven't done before. And so relying on the internet, web searches, websites like Stack Exchange, which is where people post questions and other people post answers, and then the crowd votes on whether those are good answers. These are really useful tools. You're going to use them all the time, and you should feel quite comfortable getting stuck and then going to the web and looking for answers that way. Not all those answers are going to be exactly the answer you're looking for, but you're going to also develop the skill of looking at an answer, copying that into your own coding work, and then adapting it and editing it in such a way that you can actually make it work. Along the way, some things won't work. You'll go down you know, sort of rabbit holes and dead ends, and you'll have to back up and find other solutions. That's just all part of the natural process. So expect to make lots of errors, get used to that process. That's just the way coding goes. In the last couple of years, AI has advanced. You've heard about ChatGPT and Google Bard and all these large language models, generative AI. These have been applied to coding as well, and they're revolutionary tools. In this course, we're going to teach you how to use GitHub Copilot, which is an AI coding assistant. It can increase efficiency and productivity in the context of this course. No, it's not cheating. We're working very actively to generate assignments in such a way that you can't quote unquote, cheat by using AI, but rather we're going to teach you how to use AI as a tool to make you more efficient and productive. And ultimately, the great thing about things like GitHub Copilot is that you can focus more on what you're doing with the data rather than how you do it. And so when we're doing data science, we're not doing it for the love of coding necessarily. We're doing coding because we want to do things with data and extract meaning and AI assistants can get us to that extracting meaning faster. So we're going to teach you how to use Copilot, but we're also going to teach you that using Copilot means fixing Copilot's errors instead of just your own errors. In my experience, Copilot makes errors all the time, and it's critical to learn enough Python that you understand how to read the code that Copilot generates and how to debug it. That is how to identify errors and fix them. Even when you get code from Copilot and it runs and it generates results, it's really important to look at those results, think about it, test them, be sure that Copilot's doing what you think it's doing. Because I've had experiences, and I'll demonstrate in this course, where I ask Copilot to do something like compute 95% confidence intervals. And it generates numbers and tells me they're 95% confidence intervals. But if you look at those numbers, they're not the right numbers. And so you have to have some critical understanding of what you're trying to do, what the results should look like, and ways of testing those and ensuring that Copilot is doing the right thing. And it turns out it's also important to learn how to write good prompts for Copilot to reduce errors. So as you get better at coding, understanding code, and understanding data, you can write better prompts that are more explicit, more precise, and are more likely to generate accurate functional code than if you don't know how to do that. Another thing to understand is this is a course on neural data science that teaches you how to write some Python code to achieve goals in neural data science. This is not computer science 101. Our focus is on learning to use code as a tool for data science. Data science requires an understanding of the nature of the data you have, what it can tell you, and what questions you're asking it. Our focus isn't on the things you might learn in computer science, like software development database development, other areas of computer science, networking, things like that. 
So it's very different. And I've had students in the course before who had taken an introductory computer science course and said, well, you're not teaching it the same way and you're not, you're going faster and you're not spending as much time on some of the basics. And that's because again, the purposes are different here and this isn't a first year course. It's not a freshman course. It's aimed at students who are in at least third year undergraduate, maybe graduate, it's accessible to third year undergraduate. So, so our expectations are higher and we do move faster. But again, the resources are there for you to support you and you just need to put in the time. If you don't understand something, just keep working on it. If you're taking the course, you have an instructor, you have a TA, be sure to ask them, ask your classmates for help as well. Another thing to understand, and I touched on this already, coding is a skill. It's not a set of memorized facts. So you can't just sit down and read the textbook or watch the videos and learn how to code and do data science. You actually have to do it. It's what we call in psychology and neuroscience, a procedural skill. That means it's like riding a bicycle. You have to do it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. When we teach this as a course, it's designated as a lab course because you're actually doing things, not just memorizing. It requires time and practice to do it well. And the reality of coding is you will spend lots of time going in circles, getting frustrated, getting errors. This is a normal part of the process. And so it's important to have in your mind, this is a part of the process. So try not to have too many moments like the one shown in this picture. You'll get there, I promise. But try to just take a, a very calm, zen, problem-solving kind of approach. Okay, we've got an error. How do we fix it? Do some web searches. Try a few different things. It's not a measure twice, cut once kind of situation. It's try lots of things, break it, get errors until you get the right thing. And finally, style matters. I touched on this already. You can achieve the same goal by writing code in many different ways. Some of it's better, cleaner, and more readable and more consistent than others. And we're gonna put a focus on teaching you how to write clean, readable, and consistent code and adhering to good programming style. Python is not just a programming language. There's actually a style guide for Python and there's ways that you're expected to do things. Not all of those expectations you have to follow. So you can write Python code in ways that are not consistent with Python style guidelines, but you'll find that other people find that harder to read. You may find it harder to read and it's not good practice. If you've been taught to write, say in psychology, using the American Psychological Association format or APA format for, for writing style, programming style is kind of the same idea for coding. If we're consistent, we use good coding style, it's more transparent, easier for other people to read, they know where to find certain things, it's easier to understand. And again, I'm highlighting the headline from an article in Nature Reviews Neuroscience, where they're really emphasizing the same point. Code has become essential to neuroscience and improving code readability benefits individual researchers and the wider neuroscience community. All right, so finally, the next video goes into how to set up your computer for data science. But just quickly, this is what we call the tech stack or the, the various technology tools that comprise this course. So there's a course website, it's hosted on a platform called GitHub that we'll explain very soon. You can see the URL there. All of the chapters of the textbook, at least the ones where we're teaching you code and working through things, those are lessons on YouTube saved as videos as well as the textbook itself. I should clarify the course website has materials that are more specific to the course, but it also has all the exercises that you can download and work through on your own. And you can get those from there. We'll talk about how you do that in the next lesson. We're gonna be using GitHub itself. GitHub is a cloud-based platform for storing code, and then you can download code, make modifications, push it there. It's also a platform for working collaboratively on code and for developing code and disseminating code. We're going to be using Python, as I've talked about already. We're going to be installing it through a package manager called Anaconda. And then most of our work is going to be in an application called Visual Studio Code, which allows you to edit code, to run it, to see the results, to push and pull your code from the GitHub Cloud platform. And it has a bunch of extensions that extend the functionality of VS Code, including GitHub Copilot, the AI coding assistant, Data Wrangler, which allows you to work with and visualize tables of data, and many other tools as well. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again in the next lesson.